everyone, and welcome to On the Road with Jesus. I'm your host, Rhody Fisher, and we're coming to you live from Hope Radio. I am so thrilled and enamored still by that lead-in song by Clint Gonzalez. Thank you, Clint, and Group 3 and 1 for doing that for us. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we welcome you here this morning and we ask that our hearts would align with yours. Father, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit today. Father, thank you, Lord, for giving this, uh, us this opportunity to share your word and you with others. Help me, Lord, to lay my burdens down, Lord, today. Lord, you say that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So be with us here today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to Psalms today. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Psalms. Um, one of the things I love about this book is you can go to Psalms when you're happy or sad. There's always something in there for you. When you're sick or well, there's something there for you. And it's right in the middle of the Bible. So it works really well. You just open the Bible up in the middle, and there it is, Psalms. Um, but I do want to say a couple of things about Psalm. Um, it's a book that the Jews used as their hymnal. And I use that in a very loose way. Um, but it is their songbook. And it's meant to be sung. It doesn't rhyme so much as the theme is throughout that verse, um, whatever you know, whatever chapter you're reading. And I think there's 150 um, chapters in that book. I'll have to check my notes. And and King David wrote about seven. three or four of those that they give credit to him or someone else. But I don't know if you know this, but there's other authors. And if you go to some of your Bibles that have um, like a little, you know, background on it, you know, Moses read, wrote two of those Psalms. Um, um, Hezekiah wrote 10 of those Psalms. Uh, let's see. Got to look at my notes. Anyhow, um, I like the fact that David even wrote some of these psalms given to him by the Lord, of course, as a shepherd boy. I mean, think of him on the hills with his sheep and getting these words from the Lord and singing those. Um, you probably uh, remember um, that he sang for Saul when Saul was... Um, troubled and he would sing those psalms to Saul um, anyhow let me get right in oh and of course his son Solomon I think wrote two of the psalms too but let me start with Psalm 1 blessed is the Lord give us understanding of your word please blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. 
He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but not the way of the wicked, and they will perish. Okay, that's a harsh message, right? And it really is talking about godly wisdom here that um, will delight in the law of the Lord. They will meditate on it day and night. They're like a tree planted next to the water. And you know, when you think about this tree planted next to the water, it's getting all of its nutrients from the water, from the earth there, and it withstands every type of weather. So we as Christians or people that are following Jesus, you know, it's not always going to be sunny days. It's going to be rainy days. It's going to be um, stormy days. But it says here that fruit will, will, um, it will yield fruit as well as the leaves will not wither, meaning will withstand all of the, that type of weather. And, um, and then, of course, on the other side, we've got the wicked who will perish. And, you know, I know that I'm not um, a John the Baptist, but I think about John the Baptist's ministry, and his entire ministry was on asking people to repent and getting them ready to see Jesus who he also baptized, and I believe they were cousins. But now is the hour. It's time for people to come to know Christ. Sorry. The time is short, and I want, you know, the Bible says he wants none to perish, no, not one, and he, he, he means that. He loves everyone. He, he loves the righteous as well as the sinner. He was amongst the sinners when he was here. He ate with Time is short, people. Today would be the day of salvation for all of us and it today would be a day good day for you anyhow um thank you jesus this morning um i want to introduce you to my speaker um his name is dan hubbard i think i met him we were just discussing this i i believe i met him in 2003 um we were doing Muslim ministry together for Arabic Christian perspective at the time. And I remember Dan as the person that would get all of the products together, everything that we were going to hand out and make sure that everybody was well equipped with things that um, either Bibles or tracts, whatever we we're going to hand out that day. So, um, and and I, I've known him for a long time and he's been in other ministries, but welcome, Dan. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay. It's uh, it's good to finally see you again in person because it's been years. I know. Been it's been about 10 years, but we kind of yeah. have spoken a little bit on the phone and also mm -hmm. through Facebook and yeah. um, and through Texas. So texting, not Texas, the state, <laughs> but um, so welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me on the show again. And 
God bless you for this show. I know a lot of people have already commented to me about uh, oh. how much they like the show. So Well, all glory God to God, you. right? Amen. Okay, so, Dan, um, I do know a little bit about your background, but for the viewers, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about um, your upbringing and where you grew up and, you know, high school and kind yeah. of okay. that sort of thing. All right, well, I am a product of Southern California. Oh, good. Uh, born and raised and been here all my life. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, I was born in the Valley, which if you're here, that's north of uh, of Los Angeles. And then we quickly uh, moved to the Redondo area. So I have did all my schooling in that area uh, and um, growing up and uh, came to know the Lord uh, in that area at the age of 31. But uh, So... What high school did you graduate from? I went to Maricosa. Okay. In Manhattan and Beach. Did you go to college as well, or did you uh, go to I, trade school? I did do some trade school. I did a little bit of college, uh, but more uh, being as I uh, quickly transversed into doing, uh, you know, building, which, uh, which my father was also uh, a carpenter. So I went into the trades and and your still spiritual to dad day. too is a carpenter yeah right? well you have to okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you know i kudos to you because i know that when we were getting ready to sell the house in anaheim we called you to to do some carpentry work for us and thank you so much for doing that sure. i think you added a kitchen and for us and yeah. and things like that okay so um you you mentioned that you accepted the Lord in your thirties. Yeah. So tell us about um, how the Lord was able to get you to finally see Him. Yeah, um, you know, in in the area where I grew up, it's uh, and like most uh, areas these days, uh, drinking, drugs were very prevalent. Uh, being in in the trades, uh, you know, we a lot of guys drinking and whatnot. So. I went that route, and uh, it wasn't until <clears throat> the age of 31 uh, where I was finally invited to church. And uh, my thought was church, and, uh, hey, girls, I'll go, to, yeah, I'll try this out. Oh, and, so uh, you're telling me you just went to church to uh, see girls. Unfortunately, that was my thinking at the time. But uh, um, the very first time there, I heard the gospel explained clearly. And uh, in the back, thinking, that, well, this is this is the truth, you know. I, I know what the world is about, you know. Being 31 years in the world, you get a pretty good idea of what's going on, you know, and uh, how uh, there's a lot of uh, taking, you know. A lot of people abuse, uh, abuse each other, abuse themselves. So that's a lifestyle that's hard to uh, continue, and uh, especially where I was, I was I was with some of the uh, I was running with everybody. I was running with bikers and punk rockers and uh, the beach itself and, and then construction. So you're. So you found uh, yourself at church looking uh, for girls. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I like the way uh, one of my uh, friends an analyzed it. They said, you went to pick up girls and God picked you up instead. I like yeah. that. <laughs> okay, so tell me, you probably don't even remember the message. Maybe right. you do. I just but tell me how that happened message. for you. You're sitting um, in the seat, and what happens? I'm in the back. Uh, of, there was probably 200, 250 people on a Sunday night. Uh, in what Hope church Chapel, was this? Hope Chapel, okay. Man, uh, Hermosa Beach. Okay, I know the church. Yeah, it's a very good church. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, Pastor Kurt Dolan was speaking that night, and he, uh, the guy's a wonderful preacher, a very, very good teacher as well. And uh, he got done with his message, and he simply said, there's somebody in here tonight, and it's your first time here, and we're going to pray until you come up. And immediately, everybody goes in the prayer. I mean, all everybody's heads go down. And I never experienced anything like that. I was actually brought up Catholic, and it had been 20, I, I figured it out later, it was 19 and a half years since I'd actually been inside the church. So you're so. sitting there thinking, it can't be me he's talking about. Well, I'm not sure if I thought that at all. As a matter of fact, it wasn't too long before I thought they're they're praying for me, but I'm not going to go up there, <laughs> you know. So, so you're you're you're. I'm battling. I'm you're battling. battling. Yeah, I'm struggling with this. And uh, after say a couple minutes, 
uh, I realized that there was a spiritual battle going on, something I had never experienced before. I could almost sense it directly over my head, warfare happening. And uh, at a point, I thought, well, if I don't go up there, I'm going to be here all night long. And I stood up to go forward, and then I found myself back in my seat, as almost as something pushed me back down into my seat. And real, you know, now I'm scared, and I look around, and uh, as I pan to the right, uh, this head, familiar head, pops up. It was uh, Nikki Tedesco. Uh, so you knew her before you I, got to church. I knew her from the beach. She would come down there and preach to us kids, us guys, you know. Um, Saturday mornings, a lot of times, where uh, you got the guys who are hungover from the party the night before, and we're down at the beach still, and and she would just, you know, give us this message of love, you know. I love you guys. Why are you doing this to yourselves? And okay, so you recognize her, and she's standing to your right. Yeah, she was actually sitting up front. Okay. And she popped her head up from prayer and turned around and looked directly at me, where and I put my head down, wanting to hide, and she immediately stands up, and uh, this is a gal who was born without a hip. She actually hobbles all the way to the back of the church, uh, which is a good-sized church, and comes down my aisle, and as she's getting closer, I'm like, oh, what is this? You know, and she comes up, she grabs me by the hand, you know Jesus? And I go, yeah. She goes, go up and pray. So, so with I, her encouragement, you start walking. That long I, walk. I'm to going the... up front, and I think to myself, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to wrap my heart around this prayer. You know, I don't want to be a hypocrite or, you know. And uh, got up there with the pastor, the only one up there praying, and I decided I want to pray this loud, you know, to, you know, I want to. Really mean it. Yeah. And I, so I prayed with the pastor, followed along with him. When I got done, the place jumps to its feet and just roars, you know. And I felt the Holy Spirit just go in me. And I, I kind of liken it to a, a Paulonian experience where you almost not, you have to not, he has to knock you off your horse, you know, in order to uh, get your attention. Right. You know, I tell people now that uh, my church prior was the bar and they had made me a deacon over there, you know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I was religiously in the bar, so, um, but these are the people God calls and. Uh, he anoints him for a purpose. So, um. so, so you get <clears throat> saved that night, and do you feel a change, or do you f feel like okay, I'm going to leave here and go back to the bar? No, I felt the change immediately. Okay, so tell me <clears throat> when you felt the calling on your life to 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 serve the Lord and to be in some sort of ministry. Yeah, well, the way that goes down is the next week I'm in church. Okay. And I'm hearing whatever message. It's it's really hard to decipher at that point. It, it, interestingly, the praise was just so powerful. I would just feel myself weeping and being cleansed. And the thought was, w what about all my friends who've already passed? You know, nobody told them about this, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was a burden on my heart to go and start sharing this immediately. And I had no clue what I was going to do. I just knew I had to go do it. So that began the process of, uh, of serving the Lord. Serving and the Lord. and how did that come into being? I mean, what kind of service to the Lord did you do like that first week? Yeah. Well, it, it was, uh, you know, it was some time. It was several months before and then being involved in church where they actually announced a uh, an outreach to the homeless community. And I so, thought, well, here's something I can do. So that was your first ministry that you joined? Yes. And and you, uh, okay. So I know this for a fact because that's still the ministry that you're attached to right now. Correct. So tell us about the first day that you went out to do ministry for the Lord. Okay. Well, that was actually the day after Christmas, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, so the first Christmas I had as a Christian, I went home, and of course uh, there was a lot of conflict, and uh, did not feel like Christmas at all. But the day after. Uh, we went down to serve the homeless on Skid Row, and uh, I had my my work truck that I brought, so we utilized that and and put uh, clothes in all the tables and the urns that had coffee and and uh, soup and whatnot, and uh, we pulled up to Skid Row and hundreds. And you're talking about hundreds. L.A. Los Angeles, downtown Los okay. Angeles. Yeah. All right. 
and um, you just see people everywhere. You see blight, you know, you see uh, drug use openly and uh, uh, just, uh, you, you, you know, this for sure is the lost, you know. So all forms of the lost yeah. there coming Absolutely. to be fed and, and coming for a drink right. for their physical body. Yeah, so you immediately have a couple hundred people in a line. Right. Uh, waiting to get whatever you got. And so uh, we were kind of standing there for a second, and uh, I said, well, let's get this started. And I pulled a table out and put the coffee and the soup up and just started putting them up, and they started coming through line. And uh, several people fall, fell in behind me and began to do worship, began to sing carols. Wow. And I started to weep right there. I just really felt the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I thought, well, this is Christmas, right? This is what we're... That's this what, is what Christmas, Christmas is all about, right? Yeah. Because Jesus died for these and people. For the lost, right. And, and to help the people. Okay, so so here are, you are, and you, you're you on Skid Row, yeah. and you're thinking, I can do this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I... I could more than do it i was enjoying it so much you know okay and uh and god was really just uh vitalizing me you know lifting me up and and uh so i thought well and and i did that with them for some time before uh i uh went to a, a another church uh and asked them if they had a skid row ministry and they said uh yeah you're it <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> so, so now you're doing it for another another church too a small yeah a much smaller church a little church and okay uh, so i want to get back to that first day that you're doing ministry out okay. there um are you sharing christ with these people or are you just giving them food because the you know the bible says it's his kindness that brings us to repentance amen. you know jesus you know says to give a person a cup of water in my name and and so are you giving a cup of water in his name or is there actually a formal you know like like sometimes the salvation army does where they they feed and give you the word too or is there no chance to give the word out there there was more uh you know they're they're organized uh, hope chaps the organized church and they had their uh tracks and whatnot and then they had uh the minister who actually Gave give, a message. Okay, so. so gosh, feeding them, you know, physically and their souls as well. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're you're now doing another ministry for another church, mm -hmm. same type of ministry, ministry, but on a squ smaller scale. But you know that this is your calling. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because Different. you know I don't want to insult you, and I hope you don't take it that way. But the fact that they were homeless is the only difference because you were drinking and doing all the stuff that was going down, a lot of the stuff that was going down on Skid Row, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So I'm sure you recognize that this was maybe one dollar away from being just like that. Sure. Oh, yeah. I know people, my friends, uh, who ended up down there right. and, uh, and did not fare well. You know, so, uh, but those are the people that God, you know, He calls people that have these co connections for a reason. Right. Um, it's it's very powerful. Um, I'd like to say that uh, uh, when I got saved, God took uh, things away. He immediately removed certain things. Uh, other things became a process by which I needed to draw closer to God, and He removed them, and uh, you know, the sanctification. Uh, process and uh, as I did so he opened up doors to even more ministry wow so okay let's talk about that more <clears throat> ministry because if I remember correctly um, you had a couple of ministries and doing the homeless ministry side by side mm -hmm. so one of which was the ministry to those that, that were in prison is that right yeah we did that for almost three years so let me ask about <clears throat> that and how that went down so when you get into prison, are you just going to share Christ? Is it an organized thing? Did you go with someone else? How did that work? Uh, that was also through Hope Chapel. Okay. Uh, that was something I was kind of thrust in because uh, I was saving money for what I thought was going to be a new work truck. 
Okay. Well, you know, God had other plans. He actually had me buy a van. Uh, as I'm driving down the road, there's a van for sale. And God said, buy this van. And I'm like, well, I need a work truck, Lord. <laughs> and uh, that's all he said. And I so I called the number. It happened to be a gal who was on the worship team at Hope Chapel. Wow. And I made a, an agreement to make the payments on this thing. And in the meantime, I tell Nikki again, hey, Nikki, I'm buying a van. We're going to do ministry. And she goes, you're taking me into the jails. And I said, okay. If you know Nikki, she's just a sweet sister in the Lord, but she could be, uh, she has some force behind her for uh, someone who's about five foot nothing. Yes. You I, know, you know, tiny little lady. I just want to stop you for a second. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew her more. Yeah. I got to meet her just one time through yeah. you. And she is a spitfire. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she has energy like you can't believe. And I don't know how old she is, but I'm sure she's she's about 20 years older than I am. Yeah. Um, but she was had the energy of a 30-year-old. Right, yeah. Okay. And, and, and Real quick about Nick. She was born without a hip. Right. Uh, and God healed her. And she walked. Wow, yes. Now, unfortunately, I, I don't know if I told you, but she passed away in January this year. Yes, I remember seeing that, and I'm yeah. sorry. To, that I'm sure you're still. Um, and she had done uh, Thanksgiving on the beach in Hermosa for 49 consecutive years. For the homeless. For for yeah, well, for the it, it was for the it was more of a community thing uh, because everybody came. It just right. became such a big deal, and uh, right. we had one lady who f would fly in from Hawaii. Just okay. to serve there. Wow. You know, it was really powerful. Okay, so, so Nikki, and um, her her ministry is legendary at this point um, yeah. oh, because yeah. she's done so much on the beaches of um, Hermosa and Redondo. So um, mm -hmm. thank you for bringing her up. But getting back to the prison ministry, so what was your role in the prison ministry? Very interesting. I At this point, I'd never even taught a Bible study, but uh, so Nikki somehow gets to be cleared in to go into the Los Angeles County jails, okay. which is the largest prison system in the world. You should wow. know that. Um, and uh, I, I'm okay, we're going to do this, I guess. And we were doing it along with uh, one of the elders from Hope Chapel, uh, Elder Paul, who's just a sweet, sweet man. Uh, has cerebral palsy, but God used him powerfully. He was also an author and wow. wrote books so our first trip out we're riding in, in our newly purchased ministry van and nikki's sitting next to me and she says uh, uh elder paul you speak first 10 minutes whatever you want to do i'm going to sing two songs and dan you're going to teach and i'm like what <laughs> you're going to teach okay i'm thinking well 10 or 12 guys how hard could this be right never let a bible study they stick us in the veterans dorm with 90 guys in there Wow. And uh, you can't, you know, I was sweating bullets when, when it came my time. But Paul does his thing. He's got these uh, guys laughing. He's got them crying. I'm like, I'm following a pro here. I can't, you know, this is not going to be good. You know, I I find that the Lord is looking for willing hearts. And so let Absolutely. me hear how God used your willing Absolutely. heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Nikki had, has a beautiful singing voice. And as she's winding down on her second song, I still have not found anything to talk about. You know, I'm, I'm reading that the sweat is dripping off my brow onto mm -hmm. my Bible. And I finally, I just said, okay, Lord, this is all about you. You know, this, right. either you're going to do this or, or we'll, you know, we'll see. And I get up there and I look at the guys and they're all, of course, you got them all looking at you. And I, I, I bent down and I looked down and I read whatever scripture I saw. Couldn't tell you where it was. That's how scared I was. And as I lifted my head, God started to give, give me. Give you words. And it just kept coming and coming. I taught for 15, 20 minutes, I'm not sure. But you see in these guys, eyes just get bigger and bigger. And at a point, some of their mouths start to drop open. And, and I made reference to that. You ought to see your eyes right now. You know, and, uh, you know having that background, God used that. I'm speaking right into these. They have nothing they can hide from me. I know what they're about. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I get done, I simply say, if anyone would care for prayer, 
they jump up and they run forward. There's just a few left in the seats. Wow. And one kid grabbed me and started, you know, hugging me and shaking me and going, that was the most anointed thing I ever heard. And I go, I'm like, I have no idea what I just said, you know. But, God just uh, poured into you that day. Poured into me. And I'm hooked, right? Now I'm hooked. Uh-huh. And uh, so they made me the teacher each week. Uh-huh. And um, it was really exciting. God was giving me, you know, it was like this for several months. Then God started to back away, and I immediately realized God wants me to dive into his word and start to grow, become a mature Christian. Right. And more doors started opening up for, for ministry at that point. So more doors opening up. So tell me about, I do know that you had a ministry to um, to Mexico where you got to use your carpentry skills as well yeah. as sharing Christ with the loss down there. So tell me a little bit about that and how that started. Um, that was, I got a call from a doctor uh, at uh, Bread of Life Church mm-hmm. in Torrance, a Chinese church there. Uh, we need a carpenter to build some benches in an orphanage. Uh, uh, would you care to do that for us? Oh, absolutely. And so um, at this point in time, uh, I was living in my shop. I had just uh, within a year had surgery on my neck from an injury I sustained at work and five, I had cracked five vertebrae some wow. years earlier so uh, after the course of years it was all uh, calcifying in there had this surgery I'm in my uh, you know my bed uh, upstairs and I pray Lord I'm still here you know I need your help you know and and I Within a couple of days, I get a call. Yes, I'll go. Uh, I, we, the first time I go there, I knock out these benches, and I'm sitting next to an elder there. Elder gentleman, I have no idea who he is. Uh, turned out to be the uh, elder of all the various congregations. That's a, They have an English congregation, and a, a, a Cantonese, and a Mandarin congregation, and this guy oversaw all in, of them. In Mexico? No, here in Torrance. Oh, here in Torrance, okay. Yeah. So um, I talked for hours with this guy, mm-hmm. and he's listening to everything I say, you know. And uh, the next week I get a call from the head doctor saying, what do you need? And I'm, I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? He goes, Elder Paul told me to call you and give you whatever you need. So for the next 10 years I had my medical covered. Wow. Yeah. See how God works? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, um, he's so good about um, allowing us to be used by him, and he gives so much more in return. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so you're doing ministry down in Mexico, but again, you're still doing the homeless ministry in conjunction yeah. with these other ministries. At that time, homeless ministry was Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And uh, when we'd go down to Mexico for extended periods, because we we did Mexico uh, outreach for years. And uh, I began with, uh, you know, doing a building project. They they needed a church built the other side of Ensenada. And uh, uh, very interesting because they had no idea what they actually were getting into. And uh, we built a, what was probably the largest building in this little town, two hours the other side of Ensenada, this huge church, which the Chinese church was under the... Uh, uh, assumption that it was just going to be a little town, little church. And the uh, Spanish pastor came and said, well, this is what I need. Um, but uh, that didn't become apparent until we actually showed up there to work on the church. So we were uh, we were v- very short of uh, needed material. So what I did is I constructed uh, a storage room and put all the rest of the materials in there. And that began uh, a couple-year process of, of hauling materials down to Mexico to build this uh, Big church. church. Yeah. Wow. And That's... God really blessed that ministry. Now we have uh, elementary school next to that that I also built. And then somebody else came in and built a, uh, a high school directly across the street, wow. which is now staffed, and we've put um, – computers in there and the children get breakfast in the morning and they have paid 
teachers, all this stuff just came in. When I showed up, there was it was just an open field. There was nothing. There was no electricity out there. They had to bring the, once they saw our building going in, they actually brought the electricity to it. Wow. But uh, it was really amazing to see that process. Wow, how, praise the Lord. Yeah, well, I, really you know, amazing. I didn't know that you built, uh, you know, buildings from scratch. I actually yeah. thought you were going down there to do repairs on homes yeah. or things like that. But a building just from the yeah. ground up. I had wow. to haul all the material from here down there to uh, hand build trusses, which uh, the building is 60 feet by almost 70 feet. Wow. And uh, and so they had no idea what uh, what they needed, and uh, so we had to design. Well, we we did get an engineer involved pretty quickly, but um, I had to vary from that because you just can't get all the those materials down there that we use here. You know, you get something quite different down there. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I understand also that you had a ministry to the gay community as well. Um, tell me a little bit about that. And, and now all of these different ministries were for a season, but the homeless ministry is your bread and butter and that's what you're doing. Um, and now you're doing that every day, I take it. Every day we do that, yeah. Okay, so tell me about a little bit about your ministry to the gay community. Well, the, the gay community uh, ministry, outreach to the gay community, started about the time I met you. Really? Actually, I didn't know a little bit that... before that. So. Okay, okay. And uh, that was interesting because I was feeding the homeless on a Saturday, particular Saturday, and I get home and I want to turn on the news and see what the weather is and uh, immediately the gay pride parade, this was Saturday and the parade is on Sunday. Um, but there, it comes on, uh, the news and God immediately said, my people are in bondage down there. He said his people were in bondage down there. Wow. You know, and I'm, I, you know, kind of went ah, and changed the channel, you know? Yeah. And the next station had the same thing. So I changed the channel again and the third station, news station. Within 30 seconds, it popped up. And so I shut the TV off, and I said, well, Lord, what would you have me do? And he had already told me, my people are in bondage down there. Uh, so what I did was I called Nikki up, and I got several thousand tracks, and and uh, with much prayer support, went down there early the next morning, did some prayer walk, and, and then started to hand out tracks. And uh, before long, the boards show up. I mean, there's a million plus people in, this was actually 2002. Okay, so yeah. it was right before I met you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, put a burden on my heart because the interaction was you see the lost. You see little children down there who are being misled. And you see the grown-ups who are misled. I started to study uh, the root causes, the health issues the agenda itself just to get it in context so in my interaction i had a clear understanding of what i was talking about but in that process god started to build even more compassion and so i found myself uh li i would listen you know it's you, you're validating a person and and affirming them by listening to their words carefully and i say with my heart rather than my head i'm not looking uh listening to to find a way to tear them down or to, to defeat their argument. It's more about listening to their heart because each person has uh, their individual story. Mm -hmm. And in order to minister to that person, you have to know a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. And God starts to reveal things to you about them. At the same time, he's revealing things about yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, we all go through these same <laughs> kinds of trials and tribulations and how do you you know, how do you, it's hard to give things over to God and our, our pride gets in the way. So exactly. the process of me uh, going through sanctification process and then just giving this knowledge to these people, I would see their mouths drop open going, where do you go to church? Where do you, you know, where do you know that? Are you following me around? How do you know this? You know? Yeah. Uh, when God gives you a word for some specific person. Yeah. 
it changes their lives. It really does. And, and staying in the Word and close to the Lord um, is the way to do it. I mean, there's no yeah. other way to get closer to the Lord than get, get into His Word. And yeah. He will speak to you so clearly about what to say and what to do. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the Word of God is the way to get close to Him. Amen. Like, I'll hear people saying, um, you know, I'm you know, really far away from the Lord. I really wish I could get closer to Him. And, you know, the, the first thing I say is, you've got to get into His Word. And sometimes it's just, you know, opening it up and reading a verse and, and making it a habit to just get in there daily. And you'll find that, you know, one verse will turn to two, to one chapter, to, you know, to two chapters. And whatever the Lord leads you that particular day is how much you need to read. Amen. But, okay, so you see this. Now, um, I really want to thank you because one of the things I'm hearing you say is the compassion that you have to have for people that are gay. And really, it's his kindness that brings every one of us to repentance. Amen. So thank you for your kindness to the homeless and the loss and you know the gays and the people in prison. I so appreciate the work that God has done through you um, and also to the Muslims. So mm -hmm. where we met, um, so thank you for that too. I do wanna ask you getting back to the homeless people because I mentioned that you're doing the homeless ministry now daily. Tell me about that. Um, we pick up food from various stores locally. Okay, and, and you're in the Redondo Beach area, right? I am in the Redondo Beach area, so all our stores are in right that there. city or just you know, adjacent to. Uh, and uh, So tell me what your day is like. You get up in the morning and you head out mm -hmm. to the stores with your van. Yeah, I, I want to make this doable. So um, the way I do that is uh, typically we're done by 9, 9.30 every morning oh. uh, locally during the week because uh, on the weekends we go to Venice Beach, so that's a little m more effort. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the idea is to um, – the ministry goes in all directions. I, I don't necessarily say it's a homeless ministry. It's to the stores that we pick up from. It's from uh, – authorities or uh, entities within the community that uh, we also uh, bring food to or, or they come and get food from us and so the same uh, mindset the same compassion uh, needs to be extended to all these people and it becomes a real challenge to do okay. that so you go to the five or six stores and you pick mm -hmm. up you know the food that they give you and you've got it all in your van do you have help or do you do this alone uh, I, I typically have at least one person with me. Okay. And uh, so you go to a set place. Is it the same place every day or is it, I um, know that you said Venice is a different day, but, you know, the rest of the time, are you in one area? Yeah. Um, we have several stores uh, that we'd pick up on Monday. We have our Monday stores. It's typically the same stores, but it does have some uh, variants. So. so you uh, go to a, a, a set store place and you hand out food correct and so the homeless know where you are yeah every day right and they come to you for food now tell me about the food that you get um do you have to make sandwiches or tell me what you're doing right now to get yeah, that well, food out? when we started out we did that and uh realizing uh through uh reading uh the health department uh you know requirements and restrictions and all that for your area well, it's, it's typically across the board, but uh, they'll ha they have allowances for if you have a kitchen, then you have to, it's like a restaurant, they'll come in and inspect and all that. And I want to avoid all that, uh, make it as quick and easy as possible. So we get all their prepackaged stuff, we get fruits, vegetables, we get their breads, we uh, can receive meats, but I don't, uh, I don't typically hand that doesn't hand out to the, yeah, yeah. the homeless it'll go to other ministries that cook okay 
Yeah. So you do take the food that you can't hand out to the homeless, but you give it to another another resource that you right, use. Right. Okay, so you're getting prepackaged salads, you're getting you're getting fruit and you you just how, how do you hand it out? Do you bag it first no. or do you do like a smorgasbord and yeah. have them take what they that's, want? That's how we do it. We actually uh, box everything and then when we get to our location we put it in rows and uh, our the recipients are in a line. So and, they're standing in line waiting right. for, to, for this to happen. Now, do you do a Bible study at all before you hand out the I do. The I, I'll read uh, scripture. Okay. And uh, they keep asking for more. Uh, when I, when I originally you mean started. More, more of the Word of God? Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, right. there's actually people uh, who, uh, want, uh, you know, ba- we baptize now in uh, Bible studies, and we kind of steer them to what church, you know, churches and where they're at and, and uh, get them hooked up with the— uh, that's the primary focus is to get them hooked up with a solid uh, church or, um, you know, a lot of these people are suffering uh, various things. Right. Abuse. But you're giving the word out and food out daily. Daily, right. Okay, so, um, and for some people, this is their only meal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I imagine that you see some of the same people and then you don't see them anymore because right. they've gotten saved and you plug them in to a church or something right wow that is dedication and so um you're doing a bible study every single day then correct so i uh, you know i well the way that goes down is i'll read maybe half a chapter and then hit on uh a couple point i usually keep it down to just a couple points so it's mm-hmm. They have a takeaway, something they can process. Do you give them tracks to something they can hold on to, or do you have anything? I, I used to, and I do have a lot of materials. Yeah. But uh, it's on it's upon request, um, you know. And I've I've done the the various ministries, even working with George, uh, in, with in Arabic and Arabic yeah. Christian perspective, which is now Ministry to Muslims. Ministry to Muslims, yeah. yeah. So when I am hand, and even with George years ago, I look somebody in the eye, and I offer it to them, not sticking it in their face, but in a, so they actually have to. Uh, Want it and come yeah, and get it. Yeah, they actually have to make a motion towards it. Mm-hmm. And well, if they don't, idea. I pull it back in. And there's been times where I pull it back in and go, oh, okay, let me have that, you know. Yeah, it piques their interest. <laughs> right. Well, Good. you're not pushing like it that. on them. You, yeah, you know? that's great. Now, I want to get back to the homeless um, you've had over the years your ministry changing where you were doing it once a week just mm-hmm. to Skid Row. Um, you're, now you're doing it every single day, no breaks. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, you're done by 9 o'clock and you're on to your real job and, you know, carpentry, right? Yeah, and we're, we're um, in COVID, so that's not happening. But, okay. No. Um, but... I'd like to have you speak to um, doing this type of ministry for the average person like myself that might want to just go out and hand some food out. Um, What would you recommend? Say me as a family want to take the kids and, you know, get something out into their hands. Right. Um, Do you think that we have to go with a church? Or can we go alone? Yeah, there's there's various ways. I, I think you have to look into your community and see what the need is, and see what God puts on your heart, mm-hmm. and uh, and go with that. Um, what what we're doing is, um, you know, working with these uh, these various stores uh, uh, is uh, it, it can be demanding because there's a lot of times there's people in there who don't necessarily like what you're doing. Uh-huh. Most do, but that's not true for everyone. Uh-huh. And that's true throughout the community. I found myself in places where people started calling the police. Right. And, um, again, some of the police like what you're doing because they understand you actually are helping people. We, I should say that we are working with not just other ministry, ministries, but government entities that actually work to get them housing or into programs for abuse or whatever my my real heart is for these women who've 
suffer greatly, you know, whatever abuse sexually or just emotionally. I, I don't, Physically, yeah. I don't feel a woman should be on the streets at all. Child, women, that, that shouldn't be happening. You know, we're, we live in the richest nation in the world. And we should not have anybody on the streets, but a lot of people do choose to be on the streets, and um, you know that's their choice. And and I, I don't judge them one way or another. It's not for me to judge. I give them whoever asks for food. And in Venice, we've actually had people who have houses down there, in expensive houses, get in line for food. Mm-hmm. And the people go, there. they're not homeless, and I go, but they need food. You know, they, right. what they really need is something else. But well, the, the, you know, this COVID thing has thrown a whole different thing in the arena of the homeless. I mean, there are a lot of people that ho- have homes and they can't buy food. Right. And there's a lot of people that have taken in family members and consequently the number of people that are that are yeah. in their house to feed them, yeah. is greater than they can handle. And um, so there's a lot of different reasons that we have people standing in line for food. Yeah. And um, so, but you, I, I, I guess I wanted to hear what other, what we can do, you know. Right. Is there, do we just throw money at it? Do we try to try to make a couple of sandwiches and hand them out? Do we go to McDonald's and buy them a hamburger and give it out? I guess all of that. Yeah, if there's somebody in your community that's actually doing this and they're doing a good job of it, it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel. You might want to lift them up, you know, and support them in what they're doing. But if God puts something specifically on your heart to do, I think you need to go with that, you know, because you'll find yourself... The idea is to have these conversations and learn who these people are. That right. Though I feed them in the morning, I'll drive around late at night and I'll see these same people on out and, you know, walking around on the streets and I'll honk at them and wave and depending on the reality. And, it, you know, sometimes they just light up because mm-hmm. nobody's doing that. Yeah, you nobody's know. recognizing that they're in need for some some recognition, recognition like somebody affirmation yes yes um, the girls especially they got to hide you know they, and um you know me being a guy it makes it tough right. uh, i do have some women who uh are available to an extent but uh uh you know when i'm driving around late night and i, I find myself doing that sometimes uh, in one case in point, there was this old gal in Redondo who had been on the streets for 30 years. Wow. Uh, she and Her story was that the city of Redondo had stolen her family house. And so she slept on a bench, a bus bench, on Catalina Avenue mm-hmm. uh, for years. And I'd see her in the middle of the night in winter, sometimes standing next to her stuff. And, you know, at that age, she's slouched over and, you know. I'm not, you know, her, her posture was already. Is she you know, still alive or is she? Well, she recently got housing. Oh, and, great. Yeah, she's been in housing for four or five months. And, wow. And her feet at this time were, when she initially went in, she was in horrible health. Yeah. And, you know, just horrible. And so now they're able to get her all that, all those needs are being met. So. Okay. Um I want to ask you, I know that you have a Facebook page. I do. Um, yeah. And it's Dan, Hu- is Daniel, it Daniel Hubbard? Hubbard. Yeah, I do have uh, a website, but it needs reworking, so we're in the process of that. Okay, supposedly. so if anyone wanted to <laughs> donate money to you, um, they could they could go to your Facebook page to contact you. Is that right? Yeah. And because I know that there's more needs than just food, you've got to get gas and everything else to get to the places that you have to go. Nothing's free. I mean, not everything is free for you. And you're providing Bibles and, uh, and you know, yeah. when you need it and things like that. You do carry Bibles. So if, if someone wanted to donate to you, Dan, it's Daniel Hubbard, H U B B A R D, mm-hmm. on Facebook. And you, yeah. they'd have to take a good look at you so that they could. Well, you'll recognize see me you. next to Nikki. 
Oh, next we're Mickey. At the, we're the at Thanksgiving, the, the yeah. Thanksgiving outreach. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, there's there's three of them. I somehow managed to open uh, three accounts that I was didn't know I was doing. <laughs> you know? Okay, so good. So I would love it if somebody you know felt encouraged, or or um, you know wanted <coughs> to bless Dan. Um, that would be one way. Or um, see him in Redondo Beach and and help him to deliver the food. Um, so, Dan, um, I am so appreciative of the work that you do. And I like to tell people that, you know, I am so glad that the Lord raised somebody up for the homeless ministry so that I, you know, wouldn't have to be out there. But, you know, we're all called to do something. Amen. And yeah. and this is your comfort zone. This is where God has called you to. I can remember when the Lord called us to the Arabic or the Muslim ministry. Yeah. I was saying, no, Lord, <laughs> not that ministry, please. Yeah, right. Can you raise someone else up? And, you know, it's the Muslim people are in my heart. I mean, those are the people that I have a really big desire to speak to Amen. and it's only through the love of jesus that that happened yeah. but i so appreciate it listen i want to talk to the um listeners right now so if there's anyone out there that any of this resonates with be it somebody in prison be it somebody that's gay be it a muslim person be it somebody that is you know struggling in mexico be it just someone that just wants to know Jesus more, I would really encourage you to say this prayer with me. Or if you've known the Lord and have walked away from him, now is your chance. The hour is really close to Jesus coming back. Now is your chance to make a commitment to the Lord again. So same prayer for everyone. We want Jesus in our hearts. And so follow me in this prayer. <clears throat> Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my heart, Lord, and wash my sins away, the sins of the past, the present, and the future sins. Thank you, Lord, that you loved me so much that you went to the cross and died for me. Help me with my walk with you Encourage me to read your word and to get closer to you. Help me to find a church or go back to the church that you called me to, the church that I might have grown up in. Father, help me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to thank you listeners for joining me on a Tuesday. Shock. Um, but, you know, you never know what God's going to do, right? Um, tomorrow I'll be here again with On the Road with Jesus with another special guest. But thank you for joining me. You can see me next week on Wednesday, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have a second day or not. I'll have to talk to the boss there. But um, God bless you all, and we'll see you tomorrow. There is a hope.